perfect. Okay. Oh, this is okay. They can hear me. If not, you just pull it out, right? Okay. Testing, testing. I don't think. I mean, you got it. Testing, testing. Um. Testing, testing. Testing, testing. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody this morning um, and everybody on the VBS YouTube. Thank you. Okay, everybody's attention. That does help. Thank you. Um, uh, I'd like uh, to uh, make uh, a few announcements today. Um, first of all, uh, those that are interested on Hazak Sunday Walk uh, continues on April 7th with Mindfulness Walk with Cantor Barron. And you can sign up online at the VBS uh, website and, or check with Candace, who's in charge. Um, then there's the Sisterhood Game Day, which continues on Monday, April 8th and May 13th. So come uh, play and meet old friends and new friends and eat. I'm not sure what they play, but... I'm sure it's mahjong or cards or okay. So sign up online or just drop in. Um, the new Hazak uh, Schmooze Letter. If you would like to contribute and be part of the newsletter publication team, uh, sign up with Brian Link. And Brian's in the back, or you can contact Brian. And next Monday, uh, in two weeks, uh, Hazak, April 15th, we will meet again. And um, the, the uh, lecture will be by Rabbi Nolan Leibovitz, uh, Back to the World of the Bible. Um, and the second hour is Synagogue, Greatest Jewish Moments in Cinema, with Rabbi Ari Erbach from uh, Temple Etz, uh, Etz uh, Chaim. And then um, Torah study, bring your questions, because next week on Torah, I mean on the 15th, There'll be a Pesach uh, podcast session in Chilweis uh, Chapel. That's where we will be meeting uh, with Rabbi Feinstein and Rabbi Leibovitz together. And then great de uh, decisions um, with Jerry Davis, as we always have um, on Hazak Mondays. Um, today, we have um, a wonderful presentation by our uh, cantor, um, Rabbi uh, Jackie Rafi, who's the senior cantor and music director of our temple. She brings her vision for building, engaging, and invigorating Jewish community through new museum programs, creative engagement initiatives, and spiritual leadership. She heads the cantorial department of VBS, directs the B'nai Mitzvah program, and serves as the music director for the synagogue day school, the religious school, and ECC. In her first year, she has created a VBS Youth Choir, Melody Workshop, and the VBS Annual Concert Series. Jackie is the first woman cantor of VBS, which we are very proud of. Um, prior to joining VBS, Cantor Rafi served for five years as the cantor of Shomrei Torah Synagogue in 2019 and 2020. Um, she was honored by uh, Los Angeles Mayor Garcetti's office for her impactful work in the community. Cantor Raffi was ordained as a Hazan and earned the Master's in Sacred Jewish Music from the Academy for Jewish Religious California. For her master's thesis, she conducted original fieldwork in the area of preserving, notating, and sharing Persian Jewish prayer melodies with communities around the world, a passion deriving from her multicultural identity as a Persian Jewish woman and first generation American. Prior to becoming a cantor, Cantor Rafi earned a JD from UCLA School of Law and practiced entertainment law. 
Cantor Rafi is a published composer and pianist and performs Jewish music in Hebrew, Ladino, Farsi, and English. So um, I'd like to welcome you with all that behind you, and we look forward to a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. That was such a lovely um, introduction. Um, I am so delighted to be with all of you this morning. Good morning. Uh, so I want to begin with a question. Hi. I want to begin with a question. Who here knows Debbie Friedman's music? Raise your hand if you know Debbie Friedman's music. Okay. Uh, okay, not everybody. All right. Um, who here has been to a live performance of Debbie Friedman's music? A few. Oh, not many, but a few. Okay. You've had her here. Oh, my gosh. All right. Who came to that here at BBS? Wow. All right, um, and it, okay, a, a more a more serious question now. Who actually knew Debbie Friedman? Did anybody know her personally? Did anybody ever meet her? You met her. Oh, that's amazing. All right, um, so hopefully by the end of this presentation, you will all feel like you've met her. Um, she was an incredible, beautiful person, and there's so much more to her than the music that she created and brought to us. However the impact that she had and what she gave was reflected through her music. So uh, I'm gonna begin, I'm gonna take this out. So I'm gonna begin with a very quick, um, with a very quick bio, just the facts about her life and then we will do some uh, in between the lines. Um, <laughs> thank you, 1965, that was wrong, thank you. Uh, <laughs> yes, that was not right. Sorry about that. Um, so thank you for catching that. Okay, so Debbie Friedman was born in northern New York, um, upstate New York, February 23rd, 1965. At a young age, she moved to Minnesota around age six and grew up there. She taught herself, she was a self-taught musician. She taught herself to play guitar. She would listen to the records of Peter, Paul, and Mary, who's familiar with their music. Anybody familiar with their music? So those were really, that kind of American folk music was her inspiration, and she listened to Peter, Paul, and Mary, and also Simon and Garfunkel, but particularly this band, um, and taught herself to play guitar listening to their records. She sang in her high school chamber choir. She learned song leading from NIFTI, which is the North American Federation of Temple Youth, the reform movement. Um, and she really, she really honed her chops, her song leading chops, by serving as a song leader at Oz Rui. Is anybody familiar with Oz Rui? Uh, all in sang Rui uh, Institute. Um, it's a Jewish summer camp in Wisconsin um, that actually my husband and his siblings went to um, because they're from the Midwest. But this was a very, very well-known Jewish summer camp, and one of its claims to fame is that she was the song leader in the early 1970s, and she kind of revolutionized that camp music. But she wasn't just a song leader. She also served as a cantorial soloist, um, leading high holidays, leading Shabbat services in the 1980s. So one of the things that Debbie Friedman faced a lot, one of the challenges, we'll talk about this later, is that uh, a lot of chazanim, a lot of cantors felt threatened by her. And they thought that synagogue cantorial chazanut would be replaced by Debbie Friedman guitar song leading in the synagogue. And they thought that this, um, you know, centuries old tradition of cantorial music would just, you know, go out the garbage. But Debbie Friedman was basically, without being ordained, she had incredible knowledge of Chazanut, and she studied with cantor Jackie Mendelssohn as well. She studied Nusach, she was fluent in Hebrew, so she had profound understanding. She recorded 22 albums in her lifetime. Just think about that, 22 full-length albums in her lifetime that have sold more than half a million copies and counting. And she composed, now I counted the number of songs she's composed, um, that are published, and it's 239 unique songs, and all of these songs are compiled in the Debbie Friedman anthology of sheet music called Sing Unto God, which I own, and I'm so proud to own. It's an anthology of all of her pieces, including some that were never performed. They were found in her notebooks after she passed away. Um, but just think about that, 239 individual pieces of music, and every single piece that I've heard is actually good. <laughs> so she's a composer who actually writes good music, and her life was cut short, so imagine what more she could have written. She joined the faculty of the School of Sacred Music, which is the cantorial school at Hebrew Union College, HUC, that's the official uh, cantorial and rabbinical school of the reform movement in New York in 2007, so she taught cantors and rabbis all about Jewish music, and she later taught at HUC's Los Angeles campus. Um, so this is where uh, her life 
uh, unfortunately, she experienced a lot of pain, physical and emotional, in her life, beginning with a neurological condition that was, uh, it was not clear exactly what it was, that she didn't have a clear diagnosis, but starting in the early 1990s, she suffered from a condition um, that was similar to um, multiple ML MS, similar to MS, where she couldn't move her body well. You could see videos on YouTube where she had difficulty moving and she had a lot of pain. And she would perform through this pain. She would sing through this pain at concerts. Um, and you could see over the years, um, this condition really took a toll on her, but she powered through it and um, died in 2011 at the very young age of 59 from complications of uh, pneumonia, complications of pneumonia. So that is her, um, that's her bio. Um, she received some formal recognition and going through all of these, I'll go through all of them, but personally I think no amount of recognition that she was formally given really represented what kind of impact she had. She received the Covenant Award in 1996, which honors outstanding Jewish educa educators and supports creative programming. She received the first Rabbi Alexander M. Schindler Distinguished Service Award by the Union for Reform Judaism for contributing to Jewish welfare around the world. Um, she had two sold out solo concerts at Carnegie Hall in 97, 98. And as we said, she taught um, she taught at HUC. The Daily Jewish Forward named Debbie to the Forward 50. That's the 50 most influential Jews in 2010. She was invited to the White House in 2010. And in 2011, after she passed away, the HUC School of Sacred Music was renamed the Debbie Friedman School of Sacred Music, which I find to be very ironic. A beautiful, beautiful acknowledgement of her contribution, but ironic because for many years, as I said, the cantorial world rejected her and spoke badly of her and didn't accept her and she had to fight lots of um, battles in order to be recognized and to be taken seriously in the cantorial world. So to think that then the biggest cantorial school of the reform movement um, would name their school after her was really something, really showed a change in the culture and the tide of the times. Um, as mentioned, uh, there is a compilation of her sheet music of her um, almost 250 pieces of music, Sing Unto God, and uh, that has mem really memorialized her work, her life's work. Okay, so <clears throat> we talked about kind of the formal, standard, basic facts about her life, but what I'd like to go over in this presentation are six points um, of how I, I think, in, in studying her and her life, how she l left an impact, a legacy. I chose six because of the Jewish star. It has six points, so I thought that was um, nice to do six points. So the first point, and, and here's what I'd like to do. So we're going to go through um, a few examples of her music. Of course, we'll listen to her, and we'll also sing together. And as we go over each piece of music, I would like to invite you to call our attention back to these points, with my help, um, to these points, and let's think about which of these points of impact are reflected in each of the pieces of music that we're going to study. So the first point, Debbie made many Jewish prayers and aspects of Jewish life accessible and applicable to everyday life. So in a world, in a country, in the U.S., and much of the world outside of Israel that doesn't speak Hebrew fluently, that doesn't read Hebrew, that doesn't... Uh, connect to ancient liturgy, thank you, that doesn't connect, <laughs> hi everybody, that's streaming, that doesn't uh, necessarily connect to ancient liturgy. She reinterpreted these prayers, she gave them melodies that were catchy, she added English translations, and this was a way that prayers could be actually sung in our daily lives and could be understood by the average layperson who's not fluent in Hebrew. She paved the way for visibility and the strong role of women in Jewish texts. So for thousands of years, women had not really had a voice in Jewish texts, in prayers, nor in the Bible. Of course, there are many strong and incredible women in our Jewish sacred texts, in our Tanakh. But it's they're really, really their voices have not been elevated or lift up and lifted up. And Debbie Friedman played a huge role in lifting up the voices of women and giving the women in our tradition a voice. Not only the biblical women, but also the everyday Jewish spiritual leaders. She made song leading and the cantorial world accessible to women. She said, you can be a woman and be a leader in this movement. And that really a lot of that we owe to Debbie Friedman. 
she crossed generational and denominational divides. So someone at the age of two could learn her Aleph Bet song. Someone at the age of 105 could connect with Miriam's song. And she also crossed the denominational divide. So she didn't, even though she, she actually grew up in a conservative household, a Shabbat and observant household, but really made a big impact in the reform world growing up. But her music resonates in the walls of conservative synagogues, even in the walls of orthodox synagogues, which we'll see in a little bit. Uh, and so she really did not, her, her music is not limited to one denomination. She made participatory prayer and singing in synagogues and Jewish concerts a standard. So before her time, most synagogues, especially you know these classical reform synagogues, it was sitting in a service and quietly listening to the chazan, davening beautifully. But there was no participation. There was no sense of ownership of the prayers or the music. And she transformed that and she made it cool and okay to sing along. Debbie also created influential modern midrash. Who knows what midrash is? Does anybody know what midrash is? Midrash, yes, Eric. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. So it's, it's going beyond the written text to explain what's not there using stories, using interpretation. Midrash uh, contains stories, so that's agada, stories, and it's also halakha. There's law also that counts as midrash that goes beyond. In the Torah, there's you know laws about what animals are and aren't kosher, but then our rabbinic texts talk about what it means to um, slaughter an animal in a kosher way. So it's going beyond the text, and Debbie Friedman created modern midrash, a new generation, a new understanding of our texts by giving her own interpretation. And finally, she revolutionized American Jewish music by introducing the American folk style from Peter, Paul, and Mary, Simon, and Garfunkel, introducing that to Jewish songs and prayers, which connects to our other points. It made the prayers more accessible, more applicable. It made people more willing to sing along because it was music that is familiar, music that's catchy. And even though you know, we're not in, in the same generation, 60s, 70s, 80s, and the time that her music was flourishing, her music is still flourishing and relevant today because there's a sensibility to that kind of music that's timeless. And she recognized that. Any questions so far? <clears throat> All right, are we ready to dive into some music? Okay, so who is familiar with her com composition, Debbie Friedman's composition of Shema and Ve'ahavta? Who's familiar with it? Oh, nobody? Okay, wow. Okay, good. So for, I, I want to give you all my personal, um, my personal connection to Debbie Friedman. I grew up at Wilshire Boulevard Temple, and I grew up going to the Nifty camps. And so Debbie Friedman's music was everywhere. And there are certain pieces of her music that I sang in the youth choir that left a lifelong impact on me. And one of those is her Shema and Vehata. So I'm going to play for you. Let me give you a little bit of background. She wrote it in 1972. It was the first melody she ever wrote. It was the first piece of music she ever wrote. It came to her while she was sitting on a bus. And it's a good point. Okay. Give me one second. I love you, Shirley. Hold on one second, one second, one second, one second. Is it 55 maybe? 1951. 1951. I don't know where I got 1925 from. I don't know where I got that from. She was born in 1951 and died in 2011, which makes more sense. She was 21 when she wrote this. Thank you. Okay, I'll go back and edit the presentation. All right, so um, 1951. Thank you. Thank you. So at the age of 21, she's sitting on this bus. She's thinking, I'm not really seeing people sing along to Jewish music, and I want them to sing along, and I want a melody that's gonna speak to people. And so she composed a song, she started introducing it to the camp where she was working, and here's a direct quote. People began to understand the prayers, to climb into the text of the prayers, and to incorporate them into her lives. She had an experience where she introduced a song at camp, and suddenly everybody was singing along. Everybody had their arms around each other when singing along, and she had a light bulb moment. She said, aha. This prayer is entering their hearts. So we're going to listen. So let me first play for you the Shema because um, she wrote a new melody for Shema. So we all know, right? We all know the, 
Zoltzer melody, which is the standard Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu, right? Adonai Echad. So here's what she wrote. Shema And then in the reform movement, you sing Baruch Shem after. In the conservative movement, you it's said silently except on Yom Kippur. Then she took Ve'ah Hafta and she said, okay, we, we cite the words of Ve'ah Hafta, but do people really know what every word, do you know what every word of Ve'ah Hafta means? So, uh, you know, where we recognize some words, Ve'ah Hafta, Ahava, okay, love, yes, and we know the translation, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. But she took the English translation and she wrote this gorgeous melody. So I'm going to play a recording of it. Let's listen for just a moment, see if you can pick up the words. Isn't that something? That's her singing. That's her singing. All right, so let's go back to these, these points about her impact. Which of these does, uh, what did you think, by the way? Wasn't that something? Isn't that something special? A different, inter that you may remember. And I mean, it's just a whole new way of thinking about and understanding it, even though it's the words we sing every day. Okay, so which of these points? Does this make the Shman Ve'ahavta accessible? Yes. Um, not necessarily the second, uh, Strong Love Women, although she's a woman singing it, of course. Can it cross generational divides? Can you see a young child as well as an, uh, an older person singing this? Good. Um, and can you also see this increasing the participatory prayer and singing in the synagogue? Yes. Um, is, this, is this midrash on an ancient text, perhaps? Is it reading between the lines? and giving a, a, an interpretation in a different way. I think all music is midrash, by the way, so yes. Um, and is she revolutionizing, revolutionizing American Jewish music to give a folk style, to present a folk style? Okay, good, so this is, a, this is the first piece she ever wrote and she really captured so much of what she does. Yes? Yeah, 
Absolutely. You are right. Thank you so much, Leah. That's a beautiful, beautiful, for those who didn't hear, for those on the stream, an English translation is a form of midrash because you can never perfectly translate something from Hebrew into English. So any word you choose or understanding, any translation that you have is a midrash. It's a way of understanding the text differently, looking deeper. Thank you, Leah. Okay, let's move to the next song. This is Shalom Aleichem. Who is familiar with Debbie Friedman's Shalom Aleichem? You familiar? So this is one of the last pieces she ever composed. I wanted to bookend. Shema Vehapta was one of the first. Shalom Aleichem was one of the last. And what's really interesting is that you can tell a little bit by studying her music that the voice of the cantorial movement and traditional Jewish uh, thought had entered her mind because her pieces started to sound more Jewish. What makes something sound Jewish? If you take the modes, the prayer modes um, of Ashkenazic Jewish prayer music, which actually in all kinds of Jewish music around the world, there are similar modes, but I've taught about this before in Chazak. So this is called um, the Fragish mode. <laughs> So it's, it's um, a mode that we use in our prayer and morning services and evening services. Um, and there's also the minor mode. So, so that's also a mode called, um, called uh, and um, I'm totally blanking on the name. It'll come to me in two minutes and I'll tell you what it is, but it is a mode. Um, so you can feel that entering her music. So here is her Shalom Aleichem. Oh, and here's her Midrash, okay? So the Shalom Aleichem that, that we traditionally sing, the one that's in our prayer books, is Shalom Aleichem Aleichem. So welcome, hello to the angels of Shabbat, messengers, uh, angels of God. Okay, Shalom Aleichem. Boachem le Shalom, come in peace. Barchuni le Shalom, uh, bless us, bless me in, in peace. And, and setchem le Shalom, which is go in peace. So you're welcoming the Shabbat angels and you're sending them off in peace. She replaced Setchem, exit in peace, with Shuvchem le Shalom. Please come back. Come back next week for Shabbat. Okay. Uh, and she also repeated Shalom Aleichem, which is a, a way of being extra welcoming. So let's listen to her melody of Shalom Aleichem. I would love to play the whole video, but for the sake of time. So notice how everyone is singing along. Notice how everyone's singing along. Notice that this is just in a living room somewhere. Also notice that she passed away in 2011, in early 2011, and she wrote the song in 2010. So this is in the final few months of her life. She was living with a lot of pain, and imagine, and she was singing and leading for everybody. The third mode is called Adonai Malach. It just came to me. Adonai Malach, Magen Avot, and Ahava Rabbah. I'll Teach, I'll give a presentation on those musical modes one day. They're, they're the core of Jewish music. But she understood that. And you can hear, um, Shalom Aleichem, Shalom Aleichem, Malachi Hasharet, Malachi Elion. It sounds much more cantorial than her other pieces, um, than a lot of her other pieces. So she really was versatile. All right, let's go back. Oops. Uh oh. Okay. I'm just gonna go back. Aiden, yeah, I might need you to. How do I make this shareable? Slideshow, slideshow. It's gonna take one minute. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 
So let's go back to our um, let's go back to our main points. Ah, thank you. All right. So we talked about how she had moder- she created modern midrash by changing the words a little bit. Um, she made it participatory. We saw everybody singing along. And this is a song that actually we had a, do you all remember Shiru Shabbat uh, celebrating Debbie Friedman here? In January, we did a Shiru Shabbat a Friday night. Some of you are nodding your heads. Okay. All right. Now here's, thank you. Thank you, Joyce and Eric. Here's a plug. Now, about once a month or every six weeks, we have something called Shiru Shabbat, which is a musical Shabbat. It's at 6 p.m. on Friday in our sanctuary. We feature our youth choir. There's an ensemble of beautiful musicians, and it's usually followed, always followed by a community dinner. This Friday night, we have Gil Troy coming to speak, who's an Israeli author, activist, um, professor. And so we, ha- we have different themes each month, and we celebrated Debbie Friedman in January, and we started the service with her Shalom Alechem. So... Again, crossing denominational divides. Um, She wrote it as a reform song leader, and it lives across different synagogues. All right, let's move on. Now, we're just gonna, we're gonna spend just a minute on this one. So this is one of her famous songs that's usually used, yay, Pearl knows it, for Hanukkah, Not By Might, Not By Power. And what I wanted to share about this piece, 1974, so again, one of her early pieces that really took hold um, around the world and has become very, very popular for Hanukkah. It's, message, it's a message of peace and an optimistic vision of the future. She takes text from Zechariah, from the prophets, um, and translates it into this beautiful song in English that really children and adults sing around the world. Why I chose this piece is this, is, uh, this shows Debbie Friedman as a master performer. So I interviewed a lot, I've interviewed a lot of people over the years about Debbie Friedman and people who knew her and people who went to her concerts. So those of you who went to her concerts, she was electric. She had a way of having the entire stadium, the entire audience singing along with her. And sometimes she just wouldn't sing and you'd hear the entire place reverberating with her music and people crying, people laughing, people smiling. She was really electric in her performances. So I have a snippet of this live performance that exists on YouTube. Thank God. Not a lot exists of her, but this is one um, live performance I want to share with you so you can see what kind of effect she had as a live performer. You're clapping to the rhythm of I like to be in America. <laughs> oh, what good boys and girls. Okay, now, here we go. You sing, and I'm not, everyone learn all three parts because we don't, we want everybody, in case we're together again, everyone laughs when I say this, but it happens every time. If we're together again, you'll be sitting in a different section and you'll want to sing the different part. So learn all three parts. And another song will rise, another song will rise, another song will rise. Ready? And another song will rise. See how she teaches? And another song will rise, 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 another song will rise. And you do not by might, not by power, shalom, not by might, not by power, shalom, not by might, not by power, shalom. You can do the high part if you want, though. Here we go. Not by might, not by power, shalom. Do it again. Not by From the 
beginning. A one, a two, you know what to do. And... <laughs> Here we go. She's going to test them to see if they could do it. You get the point again. Time constraints, but okay. she took the, the time. Like Do you see? She took the time to teach that, and you have to put a lot of faith in your in your audience that they're going to remember what you taught them. It's not easy. Not everybody is a musician, um, but she really believes. Sorry, I keep doing that. Okay, how do I do this? So I'm going to make this big. Okay, there we go. Um, she. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. How are we gonna? All right, we're going to deal with that later. Um, so she was able, thank you, yeah, if you can come help me. Um, she, she really spoke to her audience in a way that was captivating, electric, and funny. And she's given me, I will say personally, she's given me the confidence to do that as well. Because, you know, sometimes a service can be formal, you know, when everybody's sitting there, maybe, you know, some with their arms crossed, they don't, not, don't know some of the prayers, are you introducing new melodies? And I'll just say from a song leading or cantorial perspective, in order to engage a congregation, you're taking a risk to go out there and say, okay, everybody, here's what you're going to sing. You're going to sing, another song will rise. And you're going to sing, another song will rise. And you're going to sing, another song will rise. Okay, one, two, three, another song. I mean, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of faith. But she shows that it's possible. Thank you, Aiden. She shows that it's possible. And she's given song leaders and cantors and musicians around the world the confidence to do that. Because you see, yeah, sometimes maybe, okay, it can fall a little flat. But I think every single time that I've tried it, it it's a little jolt of energy in the community, a little jolt of confidence and energy and participation. And it really brings so much life. And then you know what you're singing. And then you see the power of, it's not fun to just hear one person singing the whole time, especially at a service. It's not a concert, but to hear, there are moments where it's nice to have a meditative moment and to hear one voice. But there are moments also that when you hear everybody's voice in harmony, it's profound. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, we can't go into the meaning of the song too much. All right. Now, let's talk about Debbie Friedman as an educator. She wrote lots of songs that we can say, quote, were children's songs. One of them is the Aleph Bet song. Who learned the Aleph Bet, the Hebrew alphabet, with Debbie Friedman's Aleph Bet song? This is how I learned the Aleph Bet. Aleph Bet Vet. Gimel Dalet Hey. Vav Zayn Chet Tet. Yud Kav Chav. Lam and Mam Nun, Samechai and Pefe, Tzadi Kufresh, Shin, Sin, Tav. That's it. That's it. And that's how I learned the alphabet. Who has heard that before? Who has heard that before? Yeah, some of you have heard that. Okay. Um, so that's what she did. She created these amazing songs. I don't need to play the recording because that's what the whole recording is. She wrote songs like, there are 613 commandments that God gave to us. Just great songs for Shavuot. Yeah. The Latka song, I'm the Afikoman. Songs that became um, ubiquitous in religious schools and Sunday schools and Hebrew schools, Jewish religious schools around the world. And uh, I mean, they, I think that these songs are timeless. I don't think there's a better way to learn Aleph Bet as a child. Personally, that's my two cents. Um, so she, this is Debbie Friedman as an, as an educator. Okay. Um, one of Debbie Friedman's most famous, most famous melodies, her Havdala melody.
four blessings of Havdalah. Baruch of celebrations and ceremonies of Havdalah around the world since she wrote this in 1983 have consisted of people putting their arms around each other in the dark, holding up a candle, holding up a kiddush cup, holding up a spice box, and feeling the warmth of the new week entering. This is, this is the melody for Havdalah, if you're going to sing a melody for Havdalah. What I wanted to share with you about this piece is um, uh, something that I find um, really interesting, really hilarious. So we talked about how Debbie Friedman crossed denominational divides. So her music is sung in Orthodox synagogues all the way to, through Reform synagogues. Um, and we talk about how she also crossed gender divides, being a woman and, and allowing you know, women to come to the forefront. So in uh, traditional, you know, ultra-Orthodox synagogues, women don't have a space for their voices. They're, they're not um, accepted as prayer leaders. Um, and the music that would be accepted in the reform movement would probably be frowned upon in an, orth in an Orthodox synagogue, right? So I want to show you an Orthodox synagogue in Cape Town, Cape Town, South Africa, from about five or six years ago, um, singing a traditional melody of Havdalah. Hine El Yeshuati is the introductory prayer to Havdalah. about that. All right, the whole thing continues in Debbie Friedman's melody. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? A, a woman song leader who even was controversial in the reform movement, her melody has permeated these walls and they are singing it in an orthodox synagogue. I don't know if they know it was written by women. I don't know if they know it's sung in, you know, shuls across the world. I don't know, but it has become their melody. So th the fact that she's able to transcend those boundaries is really remarkable. The ya la la la, you're right. You heard the men and women singing. So she's quite literally giving a voice to women. Thank you, Sandy. Yes, absolutely right. Okay, I know how to do this now without ruining it. Okay. Aiden, this is where I need your help to make the video small, but to not make the presentation small. Use the mouse. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Debbie Friedman's impact in Israel. So not only did she have, show me what you're, how you do that. Okay. Do I have another video? Uh, yes. Probably good. Turn it back. Can you just stay here for a minute? Okay. Okay. So she, so Debbie Friedman performed in concerts in Israel. She lived in a kibbutz when she was a teenager um, after high school. She became fluent in Hebrew, but she has an impact today in Israel. There is this Israeli folk singer. Her name is Bat Ella. Anybody familiar with her? Bat Ella. Um, she actually has Syrian and Persian roots. Her parents, uh, her, I think one of them is from Damascus, one from Iran. Um, and she's passionate about keeping Debbie Friedman's legacy alive in Israel. She wants to find a place for Debbie's music in Israel and use it to connect Israeli Jews with American Jews. And what's really fascinating is that Debbie Friedman spent a lot of time with her fluent Hebrew, translating Hebrew texts to English to make them accessible. And Bat Ella has taken her English and translated them to Hebrew to make those accessible to Israelis, um, which is awesome. Um, she regularly performed, Bat Ella regularly performed with Debbie in the US and Europe. She's a graduate of the IDF Performing Art Troupe, which is where a lot of um, Israeli musicians really uh, excel in their musical ability um, in the IDF. And this is um, actually also another example of Debbie Friedman's impact. She mentored a lot of young people who were looking, especially women. Um, one of them is Julie Silver, who's been a guest at our synagogue before and who toured with Debbie Friedman and learned a lot from her. Chris Harden, those of you who know him, our former music director, he was Debbie Friedman's, <laughs> he was Debbie Friedman's music director when she came to LA. He would do her shows in LA, her pianist, um, and knew her very well. They were very, very close friends. Um, and there have been two recent very well, um, well-received tribute concerts to Debbie Friedman that Bat Ella was a part of. One was in 2021 in Tel Aviv, and another was with Cantor Ozzy Schwartz, who's an incredible chazan and a friend of mine, at Park Avenue Synagogue in New York City in 2022 tribute concert. So um, Debbie Friedman has an impact around the world. Okay, uh, we have 10 more minutes, I think. Well, maybe five more minutes, and then we'll take questions. Um, here is one of the pieces of Midrash that is one of my personal favorites. Who knows Lachilach? Who's familiar with Lachilach? What is the phrase in Torah? Parashat Lech Lecha. What is the phrase in Torah? God says to Abraham, Abram at the time, not Abraham at the time, go forth from your native land and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Lech Lecha. Go to yourself. Go from yourself. I mean, that is midrash in itself. Rabbis have interpreted that for centuries. But God tells Abram, Abram at the time, again, not Abraham yet. His name is Abram. Leave your father's house and go on this unknown journey, and I will make of you a great nation. And this is a pivotal moment in Jewish history and in, in the life of the Jewish people because Abraham listens and goes forth and begins the journey to the promised land. Debbie Friedman took this profound idea and said, we can't have this text speaking only to 50% of our population. What about my inner voice? What about when God speaks to me? What about the moments that I need to leave where I am and have faith and courage and go on a new journey? And she recognized that Abram was married to Sarai, Sarah, later her name was Sarah, at the time. And she recognized that this was a joint path and she recognized God speaking to all of us. So she took the song, she took the phrase, she changed it to lechi lach, the feminine Hebrew form, so that the rest of our population could hear this phrase and apply it to our lives. How many times have we felt a call to do something? How many times have we felt that we, we must take a step forward in some direction and we're scared and we're frightened, we don't know what it is, there's a chapter ahead of us she was able to translate that into something and make it accessible to everyone. So here, I have the words up on the screen, and I'll invite you to sing along with me. We'll sing together. She, she co-wrote the lyrics with uh, Rabbi Savina Tubal, but the melody is hers.
we don't have time for the whole song, but just imagine she put it in the feminine form first before the masculine form. Lechi lach and then lech lecha. And this song is sung at life cycle events, baby namings for daughters, um, graduations, when you're sending off somebody and wishing them blessings. Okay, pivotal, pivotal moment in Debbie Friedman's life. Hermisha Berach is probably number one most popular song she ever wrote, and we sing it every Shabbat morning here at VBS during our Torah service. Um, she, Debbie Friedman, gave voice to a prayer that was not often said out loud in synagogues. There was no accessible text. The Misha Berach is a paragraph of Hebrew, um, and it asks God in the traditional Hebrew, it says, God who blessed our ancestors, really in the traditional text, God who blessed our fathers, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Please give a full healing of body, mind, soul, spirit to such and such person. I wish them blessing. Um, it was not something that was said in everyday life. She took the Hebrew. She took the most memorable part of the Hebrew and then added English to it, her midrash of the English. And she created a healing moment in prayer services around the world. Reform synagogues sing this on Friday evenings. Conservative synagogues sing this on Shabbat morning. And it's a moment to think about all those in your life, including if it's yourself, who are in need of any type of healing, of any type of healing. And I wanted to share a quote. And, and what's really interesting is she actually wrote this piece before she was physically sick. And then it became an anthem for her because she spent much of her life being sick. Um, so this was kind of, this. she really came to embody this. She had moments in prayer services where she would, remember I said she was a canto soloist at a synagogue, so at, at one, in one service, at a healing service, four people on the bima held up a talit, and everybody in need of healing was invited to come up, and 150 people came up on that bima and stood under the talit and sang Misha Berach, and everybody was in tears. Debbie Friedman didn't think that singing this prayer was going to heal your body, but she says, it gave us the words we needed to address our pain. In those moments of reflection, we are forced to face whatever obstacles are in our way of living fully. While we know full well that healing of the body may not be a possibility, we know that healing of the soul has infinite possibilities. There are times we feel like we're in the midst of a living nightmare. We can't imagine anything will ever look right again. At some point, we must be willing to confront the pain, the enemy, and befriend it, that it become not only our teacher, but a teacher to all of those who are in our circle of life. Jewish life was not meant for us to experience alone, not for the joy and not for the sorrow, for those in need of healing, for those afraid to ask, and for the many for whom there is no one to ask, this is for you. So let's take a moment now. I want to invite everybody to experience this powerful prayer. Just take a moment, please, to close your eyes and think of anybody in need of healing in your life. to sing with me if you know the words. before. 
God grant everyone for whom we are thinking a speedy recovery of body, mind, and soul as we say, amen. And we thank Debbie Friedman for creating that possibility for us. Um, okay, I see I have three minutes, so I'm going to end in one minute. I'm going to say that um, Debbie Friedman wrote a bunch of songs to celebrate lesser known and greater known biblical women, and again, gave them a voice, lifted them up, elevated them. And I wish we had time to go through, maybe the next presentation will be just exploring all of Debbie Friedman's songs that celebrated biblical women and gave voice to them. One of them is Miriam's song, which is her most well-known song. She wrote a Shifra and Pua song. Shifra and Pua were the midwives that saved all of the Hebrew babies in Egypt, prevented them from being thrown into the river after Pharaoh's evil decree. Vashti's song, Esther's song, Sarah's song, Devorah's song, Devorah the the judge, and the water in the well, which blends the essential themes of women and the power of healing. Um, <clears throat> so we'll conclude with Miriam's song. So much midrash already existed about Miriam, the prophet, Moses' sister. For example, that she foresaw the birth of Moses, that she convinced her parents to get back together so that they would uh, have Moses. Um, Debbie created a new interpretation of Miriam, a whole new interpretation of Miriam, painting her as a, um, as a weaver of a tapestry, as a leader in a beautiful way, as someone who filled the hearts of the Israelites with delight. Here is the text from Exodus. Miriam the prophet, Aaron's sister, picked up a hand drum and all the women went out after her and dance and Miriam chanted for them this song, Sing to God. This is the moment after the sea was parted and the Israelites were free, and this is the first moment that the Israelites sing together as a new nation. Miriam was there at that moment, leading them in song, and that's how I see Debbie as a modern-day Miriam. So here are the words, and we're going to sing it together as we conclude Miriam's song. I'm going to teach you the chorus. Repeat after me. And the women dancing with their 